I'd just love to pray for Peter as he uh, prepares to speak to us this morning. Father, Father, I do want to thank you that uh, you have gifted us with this man who loves you with all of his heart. I want to thank you for all that you have been feeding his soul with as he has prepared to bring us your word today. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to prepare our hearts to hear everything that you have prepared and that Peter has prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you all of you for your welcome. I hope you've had a really good Christmas and New Year. It'll have been different for everybody, of course, some with family, some not, some missing family who have departed this earth um, or have departed your life. Uh, We had the privilege of spending Christmas and New Year with both our children, their husbands and the grandchildren, which was fantastic for several days, actually, so that was really special for us. Today is our first Sunday of the New Year, and it is also going to be Vision Sunday, it is. And it's going to be a bit different. I'm not going to particularly speak to you about things that we do as a church together. I'm going to speak to you rather about the wider kingdom of God of which the church is a part. And I hope to help us all to understand and to be inspired to see how we play our part as individuals in the whole of life and as a church and what we do together in extending the kingdom of God so that the king is worshipped and his rule and reign increases. Thank you. (laughs) Jesus spoke a great deal about the kingdom, but not a great deal about the church, although he did a little bit. The apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom, and that's what Jesus had told them to do. And they spent a lot of time planting and caring for churches. They wrote letters, which some of which are in our New Testament, to the churches with only some references to the kingdom specifically. So how does this all fit together? What does that mean for us? These are the kind of questions that I hope we'll answer this morning. Let's read some scripture first of all um, that relates to this theme. And uh, the verses are up on the screen there. The first is from Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 to 7. This will be familiar to you if you've ever been to a carol service. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 16, the disciples had been with Jesus for a while. He had asked them, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus, part of Jesus' answer to Peter is this, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then over in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 19 to 22. This is part of Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. He refers to the incomparably great power of God for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. First of all, let's look at something about understanding the kingdom. 
See, the kingdom of God could be defined as, has been defined as, the effective reign of God. Because his reign is not yet effective overall. We only have to look briefly at life and the world to see that. Everything does not reflect the way God wants it to be. Everybody does not give their worship to to the king of kings. They don't do that. Because there are two kingdoms in conflict. The Bible tells us that the way that happened was that a long time ago, some of the angels rebelled against God in the heavens. Jude verse 6 and 2 Peter chapter 2 particularly refer to that and explain that. They became what we term demons who were opposed to God and his work in their rebellion. And Jesus said that the the devil came to steal, to kill and to destroy. The the very word Satan actually means adversary. He is the adversary of God. That's the reality. So there's a cosmic conflict going on. But you know what? There's no contest. There's no contest. God wants you to know that. Satan's power has been limited by God. The book of Job describes that, particularly in chapter 1 and chapter 2. God will win. That's not in doubt. Now the prince of this world, Jesus said, will be driven out. John chapter 12. Writing to the church, James says this, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Jesus commissioned his church, amongst other things, to heal the sick and drive out demons. See, there's no contest. And so we don't need to be afraid. We are to pray for the increase of the kingdom. Wasn't it Jesus who said, pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we're to be involved in reversing all the effects of Satan's kingdom by bringing in the effective rule and reign of God. It's increasing the kingdom. What is the scope of this kingdom? Well, we've already read it in Isaiah chapter 9, right at the beginning. It has no end. There is no end to the increase of his kingdom. God rightfully rules and reigns over everybody and everything, doesn't he? I get quite indignant, and I hope you do, when you see things around you which are not reflective of the way God wants them to be. Where you see a political system or a a corrupt person, or institution, or or manipulative leadership, or whatever it might be that doesn't reflect the way God wants it to be. People stuck in poverty without anybody helping them to get out of it. Doesn't reflect the heart of God. There are countless ways in which the king and his kingdom are not currently reflected on the earth. Worst of all, People not acknowledging that the King of Kings is who he is. Not worshipping him. Not giving lives to him in true worship and submission and following and obedience. That should get us angry. There's a righteous indignation. Which, you know what? Jesus showed that profoundly when he came across the money changers in the temple, didn't he? And his anger rose up and he drove them out, the Bible says. Pretty aggressively, it would seem. They didn't like what was going on, but then he didn't like what they were doing. So he decided to do something about it. The scope of the kingdom has no end. Every realm, every sphere, every aspect of life, every part of the world and the universe rightfully should be under his effective rule and reign. But currently it isn't. But you know what? He will rule and reign over all. The Apostle John in his prophetic insight recorded for us in the book of Revelation says this. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He's describing what will be here. And he will reign forever and ever. He will win. So what does it mean? This increasing of the kingdom, how does it take place? Well, it's in many places and in many ways. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. We read that, didn't we? You're the light of the world. And salt changes the flavour of things. And when you live your life in a godly way, in whatever environment you're in, 
in a work environment, in a neighbourhood, in a school, in the community, wherever it is, you are changing the flavour of that environment. And you are bringing in the influence of the kingdom of God as you do so. And guess what? A little salt goes a long way. Isn't that encouraging? We all know that. You're tasting a meal. You're out at a restaurant or you're at home and you're having a meal and you think, it doesn't taste much here. Put a little salt on, a tiny little bit of salt, just a pinch of salt and wow, it completely changes the flavour of the meal. Your life can completely change the flavour of the environment that you live in and you work in wherever you are. There are many, many ways to see the kingdom of God increase as we live 24-7 Christian lives. We can be working for the spiritual well-being of people, working for, looking for, praying for their salvation or their deliverance. We can be working for the physical, emotional and mental well-being of others, expressing the healing and love of Christ in lots of different ways. We can be caring for the sick medically. We can be caring for the poor, relieving poverty. We can be welcoming strangers and people from other nations, as the Bible tells us to do. We can be working for social justice or including racial and gender issues. We can be opposing domination, manipulation, fear-based rule in whatever environment we're in. And that's all part of bringing in the kingdom. We can be living lives that are different, flavouring where we are, bringing in the influence of the kingdom, blessing others in the name of Jesus, bringing in the influence of the kingdom. There are many ways, many ways to increase the kingdom. There are also many, many places to increase God's kingdom. Every workplace, every school, every neighbourhood, bringing in the blessing of God. And remember, a little salt goes a long way. The ultimate increase of the kingdom is, of course, expressed through the salvation of a soul. Because it's permanent and it's eternal. It brings somebody else to be a subject of the king, which is what every single person on the face of the earth should be, rightfully. It brings worship to Jesus and it lasts forever. That's the ultimate increase of the kingdom. And that's why Jesus sent the disciples to, um, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he told them specifically to go and do. And remember, the kingdom is priceless. It is beyond value, in other words. Jesus talked about that. He said that the kingdom of God is like a, a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man discovers it, he sells everything he has to buy that field so he can have that treasure. The salvation of the kingdom that God has put in your life, if you are a Christian here this morning, is of ultimate value. It's priceless. It guarantees your eternity. It brings you in line with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It puts your life into a context and makes sense of the whole thing. It's priceless. And we can be so, so thankful to God for that and so, so desiring to share that good news with everybody else we possibly can. Because it's priceless. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a subject of the king, you're not yet a worshipper of Jesus who is the king of kings, then this morning this kingdom becoming part of his kingdom is something that you can do to find that pearl of greatest price, that treasure that is the treasure of life. And we can introduce you to him later if you'd like us to do that. The kingdom is priceless. What are we to expect? What are expectations of the kingdom from the scripture? Well, we read at the beginning, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So the first thing we can expect is growth, is growth. If you think about the way the kingdom of God is manifestly growing around the world, you'd see that in North America, in particularly South America, in the African continent, in, the, in Asia, in every continent apart from Europe, there is very rapid manifest increase of the kingdom. We trust and believe that Europe's turn will come again. That Britain's turn will come again. At the moment, we need to be continue in, our, in faithfulness, in persevering faith, seeing what God is doing, because he is doing stuff already, but then looking for so much more. Because part of his word to us as a church is there is so much more. When we had our 30th birthday, if you were here, you may remember, we played little videos from three previous elders of the church who'd subsequently gone to plant churches elsewhere. They all completely separately, independently, sent back a little message, and each of their little messages is included for us. God says, there is so much more. I think God was speaking, and he wants to remind us about that today. 
Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, Jesus spoke a number of parables of the kingdom that say basically the same thing. We're going to look at a couple of them in Matthew chapter 13. Very briefly, he says this, verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. This little mustard seed that Jesus is describing, it's a tiny seed. And yet what he's saying is, and his hearers knew this, that when you plant it, it grows and becomes what Jesus says is the largest plant in the garden. It becomes even like a tree. This tiny seed, he says, Jesus is saying, that's what the kingdom of God is like. Or, another illustration, it's like yeast. There it is on the screen. A tiny little spoon of yeast that is used in making bread to effect and the whole of, the, of a batch of dough that produces four loaves of bread. So what's Jesus saying? He says, the tiniest bit of kingdom can make the biggest difference you could imagine. We underestimate our influence hugely. And God wants us to just to see this afresh this morning. That the tiniest seed of the kingdom, the, a little act of kindness to a neighbour that then opens their heart, that brings something of God's kingdom into their life through the expression of the kindness and care of God, will then sow the seed in somebody's heart. They then later discover that you're a follower of Jesus. They then begin to wonder and put the two together and begin to ask you questions. The tiny seed can grow and grow and grow under the hand of God who breathes on it. It's only God, only the only God who makes it grow, the Bible says. We plant the seed, but it's God that makes it grow. He told us prophetically to broadcast the seed a couple of years ago, you may remember. Broadcast the seed, broadcast the seed. He wants us to keep sowing the seed and believing have genuine faith increased this morning and sealed in our hearts today that these little acts of kindness, little sowings of seed, little words of here and there of of truth that we can sow into people's lives, the ways in which we can be salt and light in the environments where we live can all add up to something so much more than we might have imagined. I've told this story before, but it's worth repeating A number of years ago now, I had the opportunity to talk to my grandfather in the 90th year of his life. He'd been a fatalist, that's how he described himself, his whole life. Ever since he survived the trenches of the First World War against all the odds. And that convinced him to be a fatalist. When he's in his 90th year, I speak to him for two minutes and give him a little booklet. It was called Journey into Life, which is an older version of Why Jesus that we have today. And I said, I'd like you to read this, Grandpa. It describes what's most important to me. That was what I said. Three months later, I asked him, did you read the book? He said, yes, I did. And I agreed everything in it, and especially the prayer at the end, which is a prayer of commitment to Christ. Now, that was a tiny seed. All I did was give him a little booklet and do what I've just described to you. But God used it. It grew and grew in his heart and produced fruit. In a wonderful way. See, God can use the tiniest seed. Don't discount yourself. You may feel, I'm not a preacher of the gospel. It doesn't matter. You can be who you are, being who you are to your neighbours, to your friends, to the people you work with, in whatever environment you are, and God will use the seed. And it will grow. Like a mustard seed, like the yeast, like the salt. They all go a long way. Kingdom expectation number two. The first was growth. The second is opposition. Important we include this because we need to be realistic about how things are. Jesus promised it. Blessed are you, he said, when people insult you and persecute you because of me. In the parable of the sower that Jesus told, he says that when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So there's opposition. The evil one is at work. 
That's the reality. Jesus goes on to talk about different ways in which this seed that has been planted in people's lives gets choked or blown away or trodden on or whatever it might be, and then there are others where it bears fruit. So there's going to be a mixed reaction, in other words. We have to expect that. But does that stop us sowing the seed? No, of course it doesn't. We keep sowing, knowing that God will make it grow. Alexander Fenter says this, We are learning to live and minister in the overlap of two ages, the power of the kingdom and the resistance of this age. It leads to persevering faith, optimistic realism, dependence on God, discerning the moment, honouring people's dignity, respecting the unknown, and leaving the results with God. That's so powerful. There's so much wisdom in that. Expectation number three, victory. The God of heaven, Daniel chapter 2 says, will set up a kingdom that will crush all other kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. 1 Corinthians 15, the end will come after he's destroyed all dominion, authority and power, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Romans, sorry, Revelation 11:15. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The result is not in doubt. Expectation number four, consummation. Revelation 19, 7. The wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Now, in Scripture, Jesus is described as the Lamb of God, So he's talking about Jesus. The church is described as the bride of Christ. And so there's this wedding of the lamb, the the bride which which is the church and the groom which is the lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, come to their wedding day. There is a consummation that will take place after the final victory, the coming together, the ultimate coming together and union of the people of God with their king, with our king. That is a glorious consummation that is the end. Those are kingdom expectations. Well, what about the kingdom and the church? First of all, they're inseparable. They're almost like inseparable twins because you can't be part of the church without being part of the kingdom. It's not possible. Not the real church not the church of Jesus globally, that is the collection of the people of God who are born again and are part of the kingdom of God. The church is described in scripture as the called out ones. In other words, we've been called out of one kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, into another kingdom, the kingdom of God. The church and the kingdom in that sense are inseparable. And as the church grows, so the kingdom grows. There's a massive connection between the two. Secondly, the church are the children of the king. We've been adopted as his children, Ephesians 1.5. We've become a royal family, in fact, the royal family. We're a royal priesthood, the Bible tells us. What that means is that you are, if you enter into the kingdom of God, and most of you have, you have become a prince or a princess. That's who you are. That is your identity. You are not a nobody. You are a prince or a princess because you're a child of the king. You're part of his family, the king of kings family. That's who you are. What a difference that makes. You can walk out of here with your head held high. Some of you walked in this morning with your heads, metaphorically speaking at least, down to the floor. And God says to you today, you can walk out with your head held high I want to lift your head today I want to lift your head because you're a princess you're a prince you're of such value you're of such value when you know who you are then you can go for the king then you can serve him then you can be who he wants you to be and has called you to be has destined you to be but you need to go knowing who you are with your head held high 
The church is the agent of the king. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. If the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus, that means that there's an attempt to resist The gates are there attempting to resist the advance of the church. But Jesus is saying, look, the gates of hell will not prevail. As the church comes against them, they have to open. They have to give way. Why? Because he's given us his authority. That's why. He says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. The keys speak about authority and access. So the church holds the keys of access to the kingdom. But of course, Jesus is the head of the church and his body on the earth. That's who we are. So all we're doing is exercising his authority. He's the head. He makes all the decisions. He has the authority. We're just the body. We're the rest. We do the stuff on behalf of the head. God appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. And make disciples of all nations. You're the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be one witnesses to the ends of the earth. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Matthew 24. Broadcast the seed. Seed grows. The church is designed, notice, to be a body. You are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it, Paul says in writing to the Corinthians. To be joined, not separate individuals, but each one of you part of his body, his his church. And if you're not part of a, a local church at the moment, then we'd invite you to join with us if that's in your heart to do that. And come and talk to us at the end over in the welcome corner to find out more about what that might look like. What about how this fits with particularly our community church vision and mission? A year ago, we had that graphic or a version of it up on the screen that summarises in green the foundations that we're building upon that make us stable. We're going to come back to some of those later in the year. We we looked at the cultures, the pillars there, which we're going to come back to in the next few weeks to refresh our hearts and our vision on the way that God wants us to live and the environment of this church to be so it's healthy for all of us. We looked at the mission, which is in purple there. Loving God wholeheartedly. Love people unconditionally. That's being the salt of the earth. It's all part of it, being who God's made us to be in every environment where we go. Changing the flavour of people's lives. As a result of that, they will open their hearts and give you a hearing. And telling everyone clearly, being the light of the world that Jesus called us to. It's all to increase the kingdom. That's what it's about. So there are more worshippers of the king. The king has more subjects, if you like. In many ways and in many places, this can be expressed. And our vision across the top that tells us what we're becoming the family of God in the presence of God displaying the glory of God the glory of the Lord rises upon you and that glory that Isaiah speaks about that is upon us as a church is a glory that is attractive in itself the very word in the Hebrew means that it's a glory that's attractive in other words people will be drawn to the king when they encounter the king's people There's something magnetic about the people of God displaying the glory of God. So let's summarise and conclude and we're going to take some time to pray and to respond and to be commissioned afresh to this calling of God on our lives to be salt and light in the earth. God is bringing in his kingdom. The kingdom of God is among you. It will continue to grow. It's very nature to do that. It will be opposed. There is a conflict, but there's no contest. The church is the body of Christ and his primary agent to increase the kingdom. And as we go and sow seeds, 
Be salt. Be yeast. Remember, a little salt goes a long way. A little yeast affects a whole big batch of dough. A small seed grows into the biggest plant in the garden. It's the nature of the kingdom. We serve and increase his kingdom in many places and in many ways. But it's all towards the same end. That his kingdom come. That his rule and reign become more effective on the earth and in more and more people's lives. That the subjects of the king grow in number and bring rightful worship to the king of kings and lord of lords. That is Jesus Christ himself. It's really important that we take a bit of time to pray and we want to pray this morning for the enabling Holy Spirit of God to enable all of us to be the salt and the light and the yeast and the sowing the seeds, whatever analogy one wants to use, in all the environments that we inhabit in the course of life 24-7. So shall we stand together and let's take some time before God to pray. Um, it'll partly be me praying from the front, it'll partly be praying for each other as you'll see as we go. Um, I want us to think of it in four um, sort of sections if you like. The first is this, and this applies for, this is for all of us by its very nature, is to be thinking about how we can be salt and light, sow seeds, be the yeast amongst our neighbours and the community where we live. So let's pray. And if you're up for this, then you can be, just hold your hands out before God because we're going to ask him to, to come and uh, give us uh, inspiration and equipping from his spirit, enabling power, fresh instruction, fresh direction, whatever it is he wants to say and to do for us to be the salt and light that he's called us to be and made us to be. So Holy Spirit, we stand before you and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for what you've done. We worship you as our King, Lord. We acknowledge you as the King of kings, the one to whom all worship is due. And Lord, we're not satisfied that there are many people who are not worshippers of yours who are not subjects of the king there are many who ignore you others who deliberately rebel against you others who are just in ignorance but Jesus we want that to change we know you came to die for everyone you want everybody to be saved and Lord we want everybody to be worshippers of yours because that's how it should be and Lord we want to see your kingdom increase we want to see to be the salt of the earth that you've made us and called us to be, commissioned us to be. And God wants to commission you this morning in a fresh way to be salt, to be yeast, to be seed sowers amongst your neighbours, in the community, where you live, where we live. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to come and give fresh desire in our hearts that overcomes the fears that hold us back. I pray that you will um, settle and seal in the hearts of those of us for whom the revelation of being a prince or a princess is important this morning I thank you that that's one of the things you're doing and I say yes come Holy Spirit and I seal that truth in your heart today by faith in Jesus name <laughs>